I, my HD camera going, but it didn't quite hook in. So, oh, oh, the HD camera. Yeah. Well, you look fine. You're, you're coming through great. And and these Facebook okay. lives tend to because I've got an HD camera too, but I find the fidelity isn't that great. But anyway, uh, thanks again for joining me, Lloyd. What's it been about a year since we've spoken? I think something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So and so, just to introduce you, you are a would you call yourself a parapsychologist? You're many things, actually. You even have a proton pack replica from the Ghostbusters, which I quite admire. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I'm a Ghostbusters fan, but I am a parapsychologist, yes. Mm-hmm. And the Ghostbusters were, were portrayed as parapsychologists, too. So you take the paranormal right. seriously and you study it from a scientific perspective. Um, and, and you're also the president of the Forever Family Foundation down in uh, the States. Is that right? That's correct. Um, Forever Family Foundation, which is pretty much centered right now, it's moving. The center is moving to to Florida, but also Long Island. It's a nonprofit organization that supports the work of spirit mediums and the family grieving process, and also supports research into life after death, and the sciences. Amazing. Yes. Yes. I've I've uh, I came to know about them through Dr. Gary Schwartz and uh, Dr. Julie Bichel. So. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I was aware that one of the cool things the Forever Family Foundation endeavors to do is you you actually have a training program for psychic mediums. Is that right? Not a training program. No, it's a certification program. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have to go through some testing and some background checks to be listed on our site. Uh, but we don't train mediums. That's not something we do. Okay, but you do. You do. I guess I misinterpreted because you do put them through some testing and you do teach things like ethical codes yeah. of conduct and. It's a great thing for right. people like me because we don't have an institution where we can get certified uh, for our clients to be able to trust that we're legitimate and take what we do seriously and have ethics. But when you have a bunch of people like yourself who are scientists and researchers uh, putting us through the rigors of protocol and then you give us a slap a sticker on us and say, look, we're, they're certified by us. Uh, I think it's a great thing. Yeah, it's, it's important. And honestly, part of it is to see if see if the mediums are willing to actually give back as well. One of the requirements we have for our mediums is that they have to participate as volunteers for the organization. Oh, oh, interesting. And what does that entail? Well, it's an all volunteer organization. Nobody gets paid, including the executive director. Uh, And so they will do a number of things. One, they might do a fundraising event specifically for the foundation where they don't get paid at all. They might um, actually participate in our, one of our conferences or our grief retreats. Uh, so there are opportunities that they actually have. The, the most common thing is for people to do their own specific event and then give all the money to, you know, as a fundraising event to the organization. Right. Okay. Right. So, and the organization itself primarily services um, families and individuals who are grieving the death of a loved one. Is that right? And that is correct. But anybody interested in research on life after death, this would be a great organization to join. And best thing is, it's free to join. Uh, we put out a twice annual, or twice yearly, I should say, twice a year uh, magazine. And we have webinars and all sorts of other things going on as well. Well, that's fantastic. And you and I spoke in our last conversation about what sorts of things can be done to, to show the general public that serious real scientists are taking an interest in the paranormal and studying people like me under microscopes reverberally and uh and finding evidence too that there there is something phenomenal going on that it's not just random chance that that i would guess Mm -hmm. someone's dead father's name and plus what they died from and things yeah i we we use the term evidential medium that's something that also julie Beichel uses Uh, in her research at the Winbridge Research Center. And the idea is that they have to come up with really factual information that is going to be clearly information that they could not possibly have known. Mm -hmm. Um, Our, you know, our, our actual uh, certification process is rigorous, but it's really the the ongoing work that the medium's doing. I've seen some mediums that we have certified that are participating in our events that are, are just simply mind blowing. They have what De- Gary Schwartz would call dazzle shots all the time. Dazzle shots, uh, I love and, it. Yeah, and as, as someone who has also been involved in the magic world and more specifically the world of mentalism, uh, which includes psychic fraud from an mm-hmm. entertainer's perspective, I, I can say that what they're doing is not what people in the magic world would call cold reading. 
Well, and, 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 you know, this is something that a point that I've made is that, you know, usually one way to tell the difference between genuine psychic phenomena and fraudulent phenomena is psychic phenomena has this, this signature of helpfulness. It's not helpful to bend the silverware. It doesn't really get us anywhere. And, and well, you know, that's not true. <laughs> that, I have to tell you that that's not the case that we've seen in parapsychological work over the last hundred and so, hundred or so years. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be a psychic and be unethical. That's uh, true. You can, you know, you can misapply your, your abilities. And a lot of what happens psychically is just to keep us interested sometimes. I mean, for me, I've had a lot of psychic experiences that over the years since I got in the field, but Honestly, they have no value whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They're really to show me or to continue to show me that this phenomena exists. That's true. Uh, the spoon bending thing, you know, clearly you can fake that, but it happens for real as well. That's psychokinesis. And I've run several spoon bending parties just to give people the experience of doing that. I suppose I'm I'm a little bit um, bitter toward it because I can't bend spoons. <laughs> ah. You haven't been to the right spoon bending party. Perhaps that's the thing. But now this is interesting what you're saying, because it makes me think of a, of a case I had years ago where I was sitting with a client uh -huh. and she had a boyfriend at the time. And I said to her, oh, your boyfriend's got really short hair like he shaved his hair. Now she's like, no, no, no. Sorry. He's a metalhead. He's got hair down to his ass, bro. His hair's longer than mine. She goes home that afternoon. He had not told her, but he went to get his hair head shaved to donate his hair to the cancer kids. And that wow. doesn't, that's not useful information in a sense, but it is yeah. validating information, like you're saying. So I have to concede, you're yeah. right, I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, so there's some... Yeah, I, I'd say that, you know, for someone to see a psychic um, or to get a psychic reading, and one of the things that's important is there's going to be a lot of potentially validating information, but really, if you're paying for a psychic, you want useful information also. Mm -hmm. So the flip side of this whole thing is that if someone, you see a psychic or someone sees a medium and all they get is information about them that really clearly shows the psychic has some ability, that's not helpful at all to the individual unless the reason they went is to see if this is real. Well, okay. I want to just, we have to continue on this line because I like, I like the groove that we're in and I think we're going to, I have, mm -hmm. I have an interesting anecdote for you in a second, but why I wanted to have you on tonight was to talk about a couple of things. You've got some talks coming up and you're going to be giving a course, I think in the springtime, is that right? About how to tell the difference between a fake and a real psychic among other things. Right, right. So I actually have two courses coming up for the Rhine Research Center. Uh, the Rhine Research Center is just the U.S.'s oldest uh, continuous laboratory. It's the one that was founded at Duke University in the 1930s. Uh, we have an education arm. I'm on the board of directors there, and we have an education arm as well. So I'm one of the two primary instructors of the online courses. Uh, starting January 27th, we have an eight-week course on investigating the paranormal, so pretty much ghost hunting from a parapsychological perspective, which is... On the, is this real or not, you're going to, let's assume it's real, and now what do we do with it? What's the application? Right. Which is so... And we've had beautiful. a lot of people in the field who have worked on applications, applied side. I mean, the whole remote viewing program for the U.S. government and what the Soviets and Russians have done, that was all applied side. That's all mm -hmm. applying psychic abilities. So mm -hmm. uh, archaeologists have been using psychics for over 100 years, in fact. So we have various applications of psi and yes it is true i mean we make the assumption that this is real this is a real effect and that people have the abilities and frankly um we see it also in the general public you know people have experiences throughout their lives it's not just people with um Develop. additional talent right 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 i call it talent rather than a skill uh, you know, and, and, and Norm MacDonald talked about how comedy isn't art as much as it's a craft. And I, and so I've been sort yeah. of applying that to psychic work, too. It's more of a craft in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, t one second. Let's go back to archaeologists using psychics. Can you elaborate on that at all for us, please? Yeah. Uh, Frederick Bly Bond, who uh, did uh, an archaeological dig at Glastonbury, uh, his, his, he was uh, – there's a book called The Gates of Remembrance – by him uh, from the early 20th century, which is available on the Internet Archive, archive.org, for free. Uh, and he used psychic ability in that. And there have been other archaeologists who have talked about working with psychics over the years. You know, just as a quick anecdote, um, when I was at Northwestern University, uh, I was an anthropology major. And in one of the courses we took was an introduction to, anthrop to archaeology, uh, even though that wasn't my focus. Um, and they had a guest lecturer talking about a dig in Egypt. 
and he was showing artifacts that they had dug up and he showed this little Ro this little marble statuette and said this was Roman marble but we had a problem because this was at a level or from a dynasty that was 300 years before the Romans had any contact with the Egyptians whatsoever wow. and we couldn't figure it out so and he very very casually said so we gave it to our team psychic and asked him to do a read on it and he came up with some information that enabled us to figure out what the trade route was so i of course that caused a stir in the class uh, <laughs> I and bet. i walked up to him afterwards and started talking to him and he said yeah you know one of our one of our volunteers is also a psychic and he does psychometry on items and it's it's always helpful because even if we knew what it where it was there's usually a little bit of information he can give us that we can add to what we know Sure. And that's how police use people like me, too. When I've worked with police, they can never uh, tell the judge that they used me. But but they right. just they treat it like a, a tip, like a tip from a hotline. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, the uh, one of my late colleagues, Marcello Truzzi, who was a skeptic, he was he was very much a middle of the road skeptic. He actually didn't believe in Psy, but he also didn't disbelieve. So he was really a true skeptic. But he firmly believed that police could make use of people calling themselves psychics because they, he saw in looking into the cases there, useful information. Yeah. And his, his interpretation was, he said, if there's no such thing as ESP, he said, let's assume that people are, are wired differently mm -hmm. and that some people can look at a, a problem set or a set of evidence and draw connections that the rest of us can't. Yeah. Well, kind of like yeah. being able to do a jigsaw puzzle from the gray side or brown side of the pieces rather than <sighs> the others. Oh, that's way a way new You always have these new analogies for me that I love. I love that idea, doing the jigsaw puzzle upside down. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because, um, you know, I've talked to police over the years. I've worked with psychics who have worked with police. Um, I've, I've actually been consulted by police when they want to work with a psychic or are going to work with a psychic on what mm -hmm. to do and what they can expect. And, you know, psychics work, every, as you know, different psychics work differently on the situation. I, I knew two great psychics who worked heavily with police here in the bay area one of whom didn't want to know anything about the case mm -hmm. and the other one wanted to know everything the cops knew so that she could actually give them new information instead of going over old ground mm -hmm. so it, it really depends on how their brains work how their minds work but there can be useful information that is given um, i think the problem is that you have people who are making wild claims about having worked with the police because they phoned in a tip which the police never even heard because they had already been on to the person who had done it or where the missing person was. So they assumed that since the, the, their tip was accurate, they had helped the police, even though the police had done their thing anyway, right. without them. Right. I see. So yeah, they're taking false credit. Okay. Now yeah. um, let's, let's just, let's get into how a, a, a lay person who, who, who's not a parapsychologist like you, who's never experienced uh, a psychic reading. I mean, I have a lot of clients who tell me, uh, you know, they try out a psychic and are, are thoroughly disappointed. And oftentimes they go to sandwich board, you know, storefronts with the neon sign in the window. How do you find a good psychic? It's, it's not always that easy. You know, the, the easiest thing is word of mouth, which doesn't really help if you don't have friends who have been to a good psychic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that you may have to try different people out. Um, you know, frankly, some of the storefront people might actually be good. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I've known people who've charged hundreds and hundreds of dollars who are actually awful. Mm -hmm. Me too. Their, you know, they used to be psychic. They're not anymore. So that's another thing one has to consider. Right. So it really is a, mount, a, a matter of assessing when you go in to see someone. First of all, deciding why you want to see a psychic is important, I think. Um, that's actually very important. Can I share something with you that ties into what sure. you just said? I have a process with my clients before they come in to have a reading with me where they write, they take a night to journal what their main concerns are in, in a hierarchic, our hierarchical structure, number one mm -hmm. being your primary concern. They have that on their nightstand or their fridge or wherever they, they can put it. And I, I tell them to assume their spirit team will see it and formulate the reading. Now they come to me. And at the time of our reading, they don't tell me what they wrote. And my clients are finding that the reading goes through their concerns automatically in the order that they wrote them. Interesting. And, and, and why I do that 
is for the validation process. But I found I used to on average because I do I had a two year long wait list. I was pretty famous in Canada, which to you means nothing because you guys don't hear about us. But I, I, I found on occasion every six months I'd get a complainer. And since mm-hmm. I introduced this process, I have no complainers anymore because interesting and and that is and, and the reason is because I felt that people need to figure out to themselves articulate to themselves why they're coming yeah. because the readings would have been the same even if they didn't write their questions but when they see it on paper being checked off they can't complain about the meal I think it's a really good idea actually I may even if you don't mind I may suggest that to a couple of people I know please um, yeah I think it's a good idea I find that a lot of people go to see psychics thinking that they, you know, without any, they just wanted to try a psychic out. And then they come back and say they were disappointed. So why were you disappointed? Well, the psychic told me all about me, but I already knew all that stuff. I said, but you didn't have any questions. <laughs> so if you don't have a question when you walk in, you're only going in for entertainment or for validation that psychics are real. That, yeah. That's not a good reason to go unless, I mean, it can be a good reason to go. I know people who just want to see psychics because it's fun. And I yeah. think that's a perfectly good reason to go. It's just not going to be useful necessarily. Necessarily, um, you, you just have to decide what is that reason. So writing it down first is a great idea. Well, thank you for that. See, I gave you something for once because you always I walk yeah. away from our conversations with five great things from yeah. Lloyd. And I just want to say, Lloyd, I, I was so you are the only guest that I've ever had on my show that actually called my phone number. And I was so ecstatic. I was like a, a, a little kid because I saw you. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, which I think of as the heyday for psychic research for some reason here in the West, it was huge on TV, Unsolved Mysteries, Art Bell. I mean, you've made the tour. You even were on The View not that long ago, a couple of years back. About Actually, now it's hard to believe it. It's 10 years ago now. My God, that was a hilarious segment. Just cluck, 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 cluck all around you. You're like, I'm trying to give you useful information. They just Well, you know, having seen the view before, I kind of knew that that was going to happen. And they (laughs) warned me actually even before walking in. Just just um, they gave me they actually gave me the producer gave me a list of questions that I was going to be asked and by whom. Oh, and they said that they're and said, here's the segment. Here's the length of the segment. They're all going to try and get their questions in. So just expect a lot of back and forth. It's, so it's um, too bad you weren't in the middle of a, a Rosie O'Donnell, uh, Barbara Walters feud or, or a Hasselbeck feud, because <laughs> at least it would have given the paranormal some attention at that point. That's what happens. Oprah had Alison Dubois and all of the great psychics on the day before the episode of The Secret that she did. And then The Secret was such a huge success that it overshadowed the, the legitimate paranormal. Yeah. You know, timing is always a weird thing in television, especially um, you can find that if some, some world event is happening when you're on for whatever reason, nobody sees it. And that's, in te- that's it's just in general. It's not just our topic. It's pretty much every topic for that matter. Right. That's true. That's very true. I just find ours incredibly unlucky in some ways. Or maybe there's a higher plan. We have a couple of callers. And I'm, I, before I take them in, I just want to say for Baglarka and Cher, we've got both, uh, both of you in the waiting room. I'll take you on if you have a question for Lloyd. So if you're if you're calling in for a reading with me, uh, just think of a question for Lloyd. I'm going to bring uh, you both on in a, in a few minutes. So think of your questions. Um, going back to it. So so you were saying in order to find a good psychic, the most reliable method is to have word of mouth. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yeah, I mean, if you're unfortunately, there are not really a lot of online sites that provide you with really good backup on who the psychics are. You can certainly contact and I've had people contact uh me and I, I can't, you know, I can't always give a recommendation just because some people would like to see somebody in person. And it's not like we have a network of psychics everywhere in the US and Canada and the UK. Uh, I know some people locally, but even they move away. And a lot of psychics, fortunately, do stuff by phone or by Skype. Mm-hmm. So these days, I'm probably more tied into the mediumship world than anything else. And we have, of course, our certified mediums uh, on the Forever Family Foundation site. And we have research mediums that have been checked out by Julie Beischel on her Winbridge site. Um, But word of mouth seems to be the best way on a local basis. If you wanted to see somebody locally to find somebody, someone else is pleased with, I think that's probably the best way to put it. Well, and that's, that's a great point. And and what about, you know, these Google reviews and things um, are are a great tool too, because you can't, you can't fake uh, people's reactions to you. (laughs) <laughs> well, except that, you know, I have to say that, um, you know, if you have to be careful about Yelp because people do post fake reviews on Yelp True. to, yeah, I, I know um, 
I know someone who was a psychotherapist and actually had some, had got a really negative review and the person wasn't even a client. In fact, it turned out he was someone starting his own practice in the same area and was basically doing under different names, doing different bad reviews about um, the psychotherapist to, to try to get their business. Oh. And Yelp took them, eventually Yelp took them off, but it took forever. We to need some kind of an app where where uh, a client can only leave a review if they've if they've sat with the medium, like some kind of a one time code or something. And well, that's it's kind of like what Amazon does. You know, Amazon mm-hmm. you have to be a verified buyer to actually be able to leave a review. A lot of for for some things, not for everything. Right, because that could help. And and like you said, the Forever Family Foundation. If if you guys Google that, and if you're looking for great mediums other than myself, if you've had a reading with me, you need to see someone else. I always say second opinions. Forever Family Foundation has a list of mediums to to check out, and and the Windbridge Institute with Dr. Julie Bichel. I always say Bichel because right. I've only emailed with her before. Um, okay. <laughs> now I I have been having a, a bit of a, a, a I'm at a crossroads. I wanted to call you doctor for a second, Lloyd. Can I just call you doctor? I'll just call you doctor. You're not a doctor. Uh, I'm I'm not a doctor. You can call me <laughs> professor. Professor. Yes. Yeah. Professor. What was your Professor Strange or something. You had a different Professor Paranormal. That's professor... what I go by when I'm doing my mentalism <laughs> stuff. Yeah. All right, Professor. So, so I love doing phone readings on people, and there's mm. there's really one reason I love doing it. I find that when I can see things about my client that are that are just again like not helpful, like oh you just turned your hair red or something, and it's on the phone, it's that much more impactful. But then the other thing is that it's very stressful for a psychic to have a person in their home. You know, like mm-hmm. one or two is fine. But when you're seeing so many people all the time, like I am and, and many of my colleagues and, and the remote view, uh, the remote readings tend to affect people in a way where they, they when they if they haven't had a reading with me before, they're skeptical of having it remotely. They're like, well, how are you going to pick up on me if I'm not with you? Right. I have a client and I wouldn't it's it's confidential, but she's a Hollywood actress. If you don't watch many movies, you've probably seen her in three. OK, and, she, and the reason I bring her up is because she's only had phone readings with me from L.A. And I told her this about five years ago. I switched to doing phone readings primarily and 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 my clients are resisting it, I said. And she goes, let me get this straight, doll. She calls me doll. She goes, these people can buy that you see the future and talk to the dead. But the phone is where they draw the line. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think it's actually it's actually pretty funny. I, I, you know, one of my friends who's a psychic and medium uh, does great on the phone. She's a technophobe in some respects, so Skype is an alien thing to her. And every time she tries Skype, her computer crashes. Or oh. she's she's actually putting that out herself. Probably. Um, but she does great on the phone, and part of it she likes doing the phone reading because she doesn't get cues. You know, the overt cues or even the the kind of subtle cues that people often give, which mm-hmm. are often wrong. <laughs> right. So she doesn't have to, number one, she doesn't have to worry about people saying, well, you're just reading me, reading my reactions. And number two, nothing's distracting her, which is exactly good. exactly. So can you end the debate, Professor, for my skeptical clients? Why is a phone reading better than an in-person reading? Not to say it's always better. But I'm telling right. you, that I prefer doing them that way. Why would it be a good idea? I would think, number one, that there are few distractions. They, you know, you're unconscious. Let, let's face it. If you're person to person, no matter how good a psychic you are, you're going to be doing some unconscious assumptions and biases about the person's appearance, about their age, about all sorts of things. The reactions are going to cause some conclusions or things to bubble up in your consciousness. Again, these can be conscious or unconscious, and that's going to actually interfere with the reading to some extent, Mm -hmm. or at least add to it in a way that could actually derail it. So that's number one. Number two, all the research on remote viewing that that has been done, and there's been considerable amount that's been done, uh, shows that it doesn't matter if you're next door or a thousand miles away or 5,000 miles away. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. There's no way in which you can. Well, and what about the remote viewing? Like you said, uh, into Russia and people, what was it? I think it was Ingo Swan who saw a ring around Jupiter before we actually knew that there was a ring Correct. around Jupiter. That's right. His book, uh, To Kiss Earth Goodbye, which came out in 1976, described him going out of body and traveling to Jupiter and Saturn. And he described things about Jupiter's ring, which we didn't know about, and the braided rings of Saturn and some other factors that NASA was not able to confirm until Voyager got there. 
Right. Because this was back in the 70s, I think. Um, right. But Glarka, I've brought you on in. So you're going to have to look for a microphone uh, button and click it. Lloyd, do you know more about this from the guest's perspective, how they can unmute themselves? Because um, if she moves her cursor down towards the bottom of the screen, she should see a, a toolbar pop up. Mm -hmm. and you should see a button that says mute and has a little red line through it. So if you click that, it will be unmuted. Yeah, but Glarka it actually should say unmute. It's probably, and I have a sense she's on her phone. So maybe, maybe you have a little uh, microphone thing. Uh, yeah, tap that the I don't know. Yeah, tap the microphone uh, icon on on your phone, Buglarka. I'd love to bring you on in to ask Lloyd a question. Uh, we also have you in the waiting room, uh, Cher. I'm bringing you in, Cher, and both of you need to uh, calibrate your microphones to to come on in. So, so please do that. Uh, while Lloyd and I talk, I'll, I'll wait for one of these ladies to. Uh, to sort that out. Uh, and we're coming to the end of our meeting anyway, Lloyd, but, but, uh, but I do want to continue on, uh, with this theme of, um, legitimate psychic ability versus the fake. Now here's the thing about the spoon bending, and this is maybe give you going to give you some insight into my skepticism there. I've noticed, uh, I've noticed a trend and, and I'm a kind of a solutions person. It's just the way I'm wired. My father was a mechanical engineer type and, and, it seems to me like the belief in crystals being healing objects. I mean, I had a client who had impotency and uh, a healer had suggested he put uh, quartz crystals in his briefs because boxer shorts, they'd fall out. So he's putting rocks in his underpants. And I got so irritated with this. It was very funny, but I got irritated because I'm like, well, that's one way to get hard. But the point is, it's not going to fix you, right? And it's, it could hurt you, in fact. And... And, and crystals themselves, I, I ha, I'm skeptical if they give off energy. And tarot cards, I, I've been getting into, because I make fun of tarot cards so much. So at the end of a reading in the last couple of weeks, I've been shuffling the cards and picking them for clients. And I actually have to open the book to read what it means. It's astounding right. how accurate they are. But but Well, they're, they're, they're working off of very general principles. So They are. You, you, yeah. They are, but, but it's the, I only pick one card and I only pick it when I'm guided to, and I don't think it's the card itself. I think it's the synchronistic right. effect around the, the whole situation. It's you. You're picking the right card. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. It's moving. It's coming through me in some sense. But yeah. the problem that I find is the new agey types um, put all this emphasis on stuff like essential oils or tower car or, or crystals. And, and I call it spiritualizing matter. Hold hey, on. Hi, hi. Oh, you, oh, just a second. We've got. We've got you uh, in the room, Cher. I'm just going to mute you for a second. I'm going to finish my point, then I'll bring you on in, Cher, okay? All right, so uh, Cher is going to come in and ask a question momentarily. So, so my late colleague, uh, who was a psychic, incredible psychic and medium, mm -hmm. uh, Annette Martin, she was a co-author on one of my books. Um, she and other psychics I've known over the years, who have offices, actually, mm -hmm. related to me many times that someone, would come, someone new would come in and look around their office, which was pretty office-like, I mean, she had she did have a couple of nice rock formations like I do on her shelf because they're pretty. Mm -hmm. But the person would look around and say, where are your tarot cards? Where's your crystal ball? And <laughs> Annette would just like groan and have to explain that, you know, the powers in me it has nothing to do with that stuff. Um, others I've known have actually will will make that groan and then open their desk drawer, pull out a deck of tarot cards, shuffle them, throw them down, not even care what they are and do the reading anyway. Just but at least appease. the cards are there. Right. So and then I know one psychic who actually uses the images on the cards as um, triggers, almost like word association. Mm -hmm. She uses the image to actually get her going in a particular direction. But she does not use any of the meanings in the book. She doesn't hasn't even read the books at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. So you can use you can do different things. You can use them as focal points. You can use them as window dressing. For the most part, they're really window dressing. Well, but this is why, and thank you for saying that, this is why I'm skeptical of, of spoon bending and stuff, and not that it's not real, but because it puts the general populace's attention on the material object, and it, 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 it prevents them from reaching the next level of understanding, which is to conceptualize well, the abstract. Well, that, except that, that spoon bending is about psychokinesis. That's about mm -hmm. material interacting with the material world. You need a focal point. You know, moving an object would put the emphasis on the object to some extent as well, mm -hmm. even though you're doing it. Right. So it's it's necessary to have an object that actually mitigates that, that allows you to do something. Uh, and that's one thing. I, I, I've done other work with teaching people to move small targets. And it, it, it has to be because of the psychology of psychokinesis, which is very different than ESP. 
you have to work through certain processes and having an object that has a demonstrable physical effect for psychokinesis is kind of necessary. Well, and I suppose just to make your point even more clear, I am a physical object and mediums, physical brains have to be affected by the subtle energy of spirit to get us to see things. So I am in a sense, a spoon being bent. So you win that right. round. I couldn't, I couldn't bend you on that Lloyd. I'm well, you know, and since your dad was, let's see if I can reach this here. Um, you have a little engineering background. Let's yeah. see if I can show that. So here's oh a spoon God. that was bent in one of the spoon bending situations. Uh -huh. It's a very, very thin spoon. And if you show this kind of spoon where the bowl of the spoon has been bent over because of the curvature of the spoon to any engineer, they're going to be baffled as to how that could have been done by any finger strength. And, if, and I have shown it to a couple of my buddies who are the best fake spoon benders in the world right. um, through the psychic entertainers. And one of them just looked at it and said, you had to do that through psychokinesis. It's not possible otherwise. That's a good point. <laughs> that spoon is like bent in a way I can't even imagine. All right, so yeah. so silverware be damned. Um, let's bring in let's bring in Cher quick. I, I want to see if she has a question. Cher, you're on the on the line here with Lloyd and I. Do you have a question for Lloyd, the parapsychologist, professor, paranormal? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I wanted to know more from you. I, I don't know can uh, about a reading sort of thing. I was wondering if I could ask a question about something that is more to do with you, bro. Lloyd, do you mind if I just do a quick reading before we, we wrap up here? Like sure, that's one, fine. One minute or so. Okay, Cher, what's your question? I'll do my best. Just, uh, just a quick question about my husband uh, regarding his work. Um, he's, if he's going to have anything coming up soon. Oh, that's interesting because I just got restructuring going on. Was he, was he with a, a larger group before that got restructured and he's been going more independent in the last year and a half or so? Not really. Okay, maybe the work that he gets is the result of a restructuring that invites a, co a contract of some kind, because I'm hearing contract oh. as well. Is he in contract okay. work at all? He is. Um, actually, okay. that kind of makes sense, yes. I'm getting very industrious feelings. I think he already knows the person who's going to link him in, an S name, like Sean or Stan or something, or Steve. Steve, uh, yes, and that's who's, right. Who's Steve to him through work? Uh, Steve, he knows somebody named Steve who's actually helping him get a contract uh, to do some work in a more, right. a, a bigger way, yes. Yeah, that's, what, that's what's going to really pan out. And he's going to have something soon, uh, like, like he'll be foot, boots on the ground in February, but April is when stuff really kicks up as a result of all of this. It's kind of like building up. Um, oh, your poor husband. Your husband's such a hard worker. I almost have tears in my eyes because I see him happy to come home to his family. Do you have two kids together? Uh, we do not have children. He has one. I, I don't have him with him, but he is in another country. We have some uh, grandkids. And you have grandkids and he's got children because I see him almost sort of excited to see his kids. So maybe there's going to be something about that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I would recommend you have a reading with me privately because, as I say, these online demonstrations are shoddy at best. But but I hope that helps. Yeah, I saw something on W5 with you. Oh, you saw me on the news program up here. Was that on TV yeah. you saw it or did you see it on YouTube? It I think I saw it on, no, I think it was a show last year. Yep, that's right. So I, I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. But that's interesting that you said, Steve, because that is the person that is actually uh, working with him to try and get him into this other uh, industry through contracting. And, and it's, it would be a contract. You are, Lloyd, so this is what, this, Cher is the best client because she's actually vocally, you know, validating what I'm seeing, right? She's mm -hmm. such a good client because the psychic process, it, it's not just about the psychic. It's about you guys too. You've got to validate this and, and, and help me understand why I'm seeing it because I don't know what the heck I'm seeing. No, that's great. I'm I, I'm actually really shocked that you said that name. <laughs> so, and it would be good to know because he's he's not working right now. So, and, the, and he's hoping that will pan out. So, bless so his heart. I'll, I I will let, definitely get back to you and let you know how that goes. Yeah, and let him know I'm here for a reading if he wants to have one. Okay. Thank you okay, very great. much, Cher. What a wonderful call. Uh, thank you. And uh, Lloyd, uh, well, you got to see me go to work for a second there. Cool. So I countered your spoon bending thing <laughs> with a, with a little reedy read. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me this evening, and, and sure. I, I'd like to chat with you again soon, and, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we talk again. Yeah, hope so, and hopefully people will take a look at the Rhine Center and take a look at the classes. Now, where are you teaching these classes? They are online, so they're live and recorded, and it's uh, go to Rhine, 
R-H-I-N-E dot org and click on education and you'll see the, the courses haven't been listed for January. They should be listed in the next week or so. Um, and just people can take them for fun or take them as part of a certificate program that the center offers. So I well. can take this course. I think I will because I want to be able to tell my clients, I always learn so much from you. Like I have like five different things that I can give people like the upside down puzzle thing is a great analogy for how psychics work. Uh, yeah. So, so I will take that course. How much roughly is it going to be? Do you know the cost yet? Um, it's under for the four week class under a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That, um, and if members of the Ryan Center actually get a discount, so we have a we actually have a really good media library for membership for people to mem to uh, become members. It is a, a nonprofit organization, and they're doing some pretty cool research right now. Awesome. Okay, we have time, folks, for you guys to sign up. Uh, to the Rhine Center, and then uh, is it Rhine Research? How do they Google it? What's the the website URL? They can Google Rhine Research Center, or just go to Rhine. Again, it's R H I N E, like the river. Rhine dot org will take them to the website. R H I N E dot org will take you to the website, and you can take Lloyd's yep. class with me, folks. Have a wonderful evening, Lloyd, and uh, I hope to see your handsome face again soon. Thanks, bro. Take care.